in the beginning when when you suddenly find yourself without a mother, you know, it, it, you don't have that go-to person that you can, this has happened, so let me phone my mom, get some advice. In November 2009, 50-year-old Liz Warren was arrested overseas for drug smuggling. She is one of hundreds of South Africans incarcerated in a foreign land, most of them for drug offences. In 1994, as he took the helm as South Africa's first democratically elected president, Nelson Mandela extended the hand of forgiveness and proposed starting negotiations with foreign countries for prisoner transfer agreements. 21 years later, the numbers of South Africans incarcerated abroad have grown, but South Africa has yet to sign an agreement that would allow our citizens to serve a portion of their sentences at home close to their loved ones. Is this a valid policy or a convenient case of out of sight, out of mind? The debate around prisoner transfer agreements is highly controversial and emotional. The prevailing attitude is do the crime, do the time. And that's understandable in a country already burdened by severe prison overcrowding, escalating crime and the devastating effects of drugs in our communities, schools and homes. But there's more to this debate than meets the eye. This is the seaside hamlet of Hermanus where Liz Warren lived before her arrest. It has been over two years since I last visited the younger of her two daughters, Megan Warren, who owns a bookstore here. I feel that I've moved on a little bit in the sense that I've, I'm trying to get a business up and running so that I can ensure there's something for her when she gets back. Um, so a little bit of positivity, a bit of hope there for her, a bit of stability. Um, but also in the sense, I feel it's unfair for me to be happy when she's not. Her mother Liz was a renowned chef specializing in African cuisine. She was also involved in community upliftment and poverty alleviation projects. She loved to empower people. So how did a popular, talented and caring community member become a drug smuggler? According to Megan, while Liz was running a cooking safari, she met a German and Senegalese couple that offered her an attractive job opportunity running the kitchen of a hotel in Dakar, Senegal. They offered for her to travel up for two days um, just to see if she liked it. They'd draw up a contract for her if she did. The flight would be on them. They got off the flight together. They asked her to collect all the bags while they, I don't know, check out, check in. Um, she never saw them again because the police made a beeline for her. The police had been tipped off they found two and a half kilograms of cocaine in her luggage. Her protests of innocence were ignored. After two years awaiting trial, Liz was convicted in December 2012 and sentenced to 10 years. Locked up in a foreign country, her only link with her family was through Christian missionaries and the South African consulate. When a South African is arrested uh, abroad, uh, even before they are convicted and begin serving their sentences, uh, we render what we call consular services. This entails uh, visiting them uh, in jail, ascertaining what their needs are, uh, so that uh, the department can then facilitate uh, for them to receive the kind of assistance they require. It also entails uh, liaising with their families. They contacted me, they, send it, they sent me the to-dos, the to-don't-dos, what they what they allow, what they don't allow. That's basically the general contact. If you have any questions, you approach them. They never approach you. If Liz has got some requests or demands, she will write to them and then they'll get it to you. But because they don't really visit them too often, we get it three months down the line and in the interim, I've already sorted that out through our missioner. And consular staff did not attend her trial or assist with the translator even though they are mandated to do so. Megan sent several emails requesting support. They missed a trial. I, I sent them an email with regard to the trial. Um, then they said they had no idea about the trial, but they'd investigate. Uh, about a couple of days later, I sent them another email asking if they'd investigate about the trial, if they're going to be there, is there going to be a bit of support or um, an interpreter. And uh, I got an auto out of office replies saying that they've gone on leave until next year. Um, 
and that I should contact another person in the department, which I did, and I just never got another reply. From where I'm sitting, uh, the reports from our missions, particularly in countries where we've got South Africans incarcerated, uh, the reports suggest that consular services uh, is being rendered, people are being visited regularly in jail. Having said that, there are certain countries where uh, the laws and conditions uh, are a bit difficult. Megan can't afford to visit her mother. Recently, she received a rare phone call from the prison. I haven't heard from her before that for such a while, so between crying and acknowledging that it was her, uh, we had to compose ourselves and we just kind of got to the I love you, I'm okay, and then the phone went dead again. Liz's letters to Megan are censored, so she will never fully know the grim reality of prison. As many as 40 women occupy communal cells of between 30 to 40 square meters. There is one toilet. Electricity and water are scarce. The women sleep on thin mattresses on the floor. Privacy is an issue, space is an issue, so all your private things are pretty much out in the open, so everyone gets quite possessive of their things. So there are a lot of fights that happen, um, and silly fights, you know, like schoolgirl fights, don't put your toothbrush on my mattress kind of fights, and they'll pull hair about it. And meals consist of plates of rotting fish and rancid rice shared among the inmates and the prison cats. But this side of prison is hidden from the public. What the wardens make them do is they dress them up, they put on backdrops, they make them schmuel for the camera, red lipstick. Eventually, after hours of schmueling, you know, they, they don't even want to be there anymore. You know, it's a big pretend. In the absence of structured rehabilitation programs, Liz tries to keep busy with yoga, writing letters and embroidering beautiful tablecloths bedecked with symbols of love, longing and liberation. When she is finally released in 2020, she will be 60 years old. I think she's going to be bombarded by a lot of people because a lot of people know her and miss her and are already talking about the parties they're going to have with her when, when she gets back. But I think, she's going to, I think she's going to hide away a little bit when she gets back. Until then, Megan has to stay strong. Emotionally, one can switch off when one has to, but it floods back eventually, you know, when you maybe on your own and you're deep in thought or you're reading a letter that you've just received from her or a photo or then it just comes flooding back again. Out of the experience of an extraordinary human disaster that lasted too long must be born a society of which all humanity will be proud. The destruction of apartheid heralded a new era of healing and reconciliation. Internally, old wrongs would be righted and internationally, new trade and diplomatic ties cemented. In that exact period, we had a whole almost weekly news of arrests of South Africans for drug-related offences. It was a big shock to us. Rul Goris was South Africa's first ambassador to Thailand. South Africa is a signatory to the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations. We had to respect the judicial system of Thailand. We could not interfere in that. Even if we had pressure from the families, we could not do that. But we could at least make their circumstances in prison bearable. Goris was also mandated by our government to draft a prisoner transfer agreement that would allow the South Africans convicted in Thailand to serve the final part of their sentences at home, close to their families, as an humanitarian gesture. This was now with a new changeover, and I expected almost a more human approach, you know, seeing the old times were seen as being more inhuman and now we have a new government and new tolerance and you know what I want to say. And I was blown off the stage basically. It was very badly received. It was received as the, 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 the general reaction was, you're wasting your time, these people should rot in jail. No sympathy. And I explained, and that was the whole motivation for it, the families. Whether democracies or dictatorships, Rich or poor, most nations around the world sign prisoner transfer agreements with countries where their citizens are incarcerated. Countries in, the, in Europe, 
Africa, Asia, and Latin America. So maybe South Africa could uh, rely on some of these examples uh, to draft its own South African uh, prison transfer agreement. Ugandan-born Jamil Mujuzi is an associate professor of international criminal law at the University of the Western Cape. He has extensively researched prisoner transfer agreements, or PTAs. About two years ago, the United Nations uh, drug, and I think it's called the UNDOC, that is its uh, acronym, they came up with a handbook on the transfer of uh, sentenced persons to try to guide uh, states on how they can adopt uh, relevant legislation or can pass relevant legislation and also how they can become state parties to some of these uh, regional instruments. There are numerous regional treaties that South Africa has signed or could become a signatory to in order to facilitate PTAs, but the government has refused to sign any PTA. The reason we don't have any such uh, agreement at the moment is because uh, we have not seen or have not been advised as to the benefits that this would have for South Africa. Uh, some of them argued that uh, it would lead to the reduction in the sentences of those who are being transferred from other countries to come and serve their sentences in South Africa. And the two, they said it would have financial implications for the government because the government was not willing to, uh, to pay for, for the transfer of offenders. But the cost factor should be an incentive for the government to sign PTAs. According to the Department of Correctional Services, South Africa has the most overcrowded prisons in Africa and the ninth most crowded in the world. Over 10,000 of the inmates are foreigners, mostly from Africa, with over 6,000 of them sentenced offenders. The upkeep per inmate is over 300 rand a day, costing the South African taxpayer over a billion rand a year. Well, according to the information that we have as a department, uh, prisoners abroad, South Africans, uh, with regards to uh, drug-related crimes, uh, it was in the region of 695. I, I think it's an absolute no-brainer, and I think what one's got to try and do is to start selling the economic benefits uh, of this. But is it not easier to take the attitude of out of sight, out of mind? If the purpose of incarceration is rehabilitation and reintegration, as opposed to punishing people, then that process will best happen in the country from which you come. In fact, since 1996, there have been several attempts to sign a prisoner transfer agreement between South Africa and other countries. For example, in 1998, Robert McBride, who was then in charge of the Directorate for Southeast Asia, attempted to draft a PTA. We were very excited. It means like only four years that we'll be able, we won't be able to be free but just the fact that you'll be able to be closer to your family, you'll see your children, you'll see your family, that is comforting. But to be abroad so far... At that time, the late Jackie Salebi was Director of Foreign Affairs. He rejected any possibility of a PTA with Thailand. When we got the news that the prisoner transfer treaty has been stopped, that really destroyed us. You know, I lost hope. We're already in the process of negotiating with India and Brazil, but then uh, Mr. Celebi stopped all further negotiations. Celebi went on to become National Police Commissioner and Head of Interpol until his arrest and conviction over his corrupt relationship with drug lord Glenn Aliotti. Celebi was also responsible for disbanding South Africa's specialized drug units. I think it's also easier to keep our South Africans that are in jail out of South Africa. We don't want that information coming back to South Africa. We don't want the information on, on possibly who's involved with, with, uh, with drugs and that. Um, I think it's going to point very big fingers to, to lots of politicians, um, to people that are holding rank in, in public office, um, to police officers. I think there's a disagreement in government itself on the, on the issue. If uh, it was left to the Department of Correctional Services, they would love to have a PTA because uh, up to a third uh, of our uh, permanent uh, prison population would, would all of a sudden be repatriated. Now that has major implications for overcrowding, 
for the ability to be able to rehabilitate offenders and so on and so forth. But for some reason or another, the uh, Ministry of International Relations and Cooperation is adamant uh, that the only degree to which they are going to get involved in looking after prisoners is by visiting uh, prisoners in foreign jurisdictions. It's important that any government signs a prisoner transfer agreement, especially if it has itself uh, nationals are imprisoned abroad because first of all you transfer them to your jurisdiction and you ensure that they are rehabilitated. And uh, two, you make sure that uh, they are not detained in some of the worst prison conditions because we know of countries which have very bad prison conditions. And as a government, if you know that your people are being detained in such conditions, you should make an effort to alleviate their suffering. For Megan Warren, a PTA would simply be about having her mother home safe, rehabilitated, and ready to be reintegrated into society. It would make life a lot easier. I find with distance, you can't keep a proper hold on her. Sentencing the lawyer, we couldn't make it for a court date. To visit is impossible. Um, if she were down here, we could at least visit. We could make sure she's well looked after. Bangkok, a city of angels, angles, opportunity, and opportunism. This was the unintended final destination for South African Gerard Hatting. He was arrested at the airport in June 2013 while in transit to Vietnam. His illicit cargo, two and a half kilograms of cocaine hidden in his suitcase. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in Bang Quang, Thailand's most notorious maximum security prison dubbed the Big Tiger because it eats inmates alive. Here, 7,000 inmates occupy a space for 4,000. It is a cesspool of violence and disease. He has to buy blankets and stitch them together, otherwise he's sleeping on a floor and there's nothing more we can do. Like, really? As South Africans? An award-winning investigative journalist and documentary producer, Odette Schwegler, is Gerard's stepsister. Most of his biological family is deceased and she hasn't seen him in 15 years. Yet she, her sister and father have now become his only South African support system. This is a man that I am related to, technically, but I don't actually know him. You know, the man I met a few times, you know, all those years ago, just seemed like a nice enough man. Odette only found out that her stepbrother was in prison when Special Assignment contacted her. I had followed up a lead from Henk van Staan, a retired Belgian businessman living in Bangkok, who has befriended 11 South Africans incarcerated there. For inmates Tando Pendu and Nolu Babala Nobanda and their families in particular, he is their lifeline. I don't think I'm the lifeline, you know, I'm just a, uh, their uh, PA and to make sure they can keep contact and the family can keep contact with them and, and, and know how they go and support whenever support is needed because sometimes they get into situations where they need a lot of support. Gerard had already been in prison for two years before Henk met him and contacted me. So, you know, when that, that news comes, as an ordinary citizen, it's like, well, what do we do? So go online, see what support there is, and it's not obvious. So we've written to the um, ambassador to Thailand. We've also, I'm Canadian born and my father's Canadian, so, you know, we've applied to the um, Canadian High Commission and informed the ambassador. And they've actually responded, and they responded quite quickly with quite a lot of empathy. Um, it's obviously just outside of their jurisdiction, so there's nothing that they can do. The former South African ambassador to Thailand, Douglas Gibson, also provided advice. But Gerard's situation remains dire. Was he a drug mule whose luck had finally run out? Or another naive South African offered an attractive business prospect only to be used as a dispensable decoy by the ruthless billion dollar narcotics industry, set up to be arrested while professional mules 
carrying much larger quantities slip through customs unhindered. When I meet them in here, is, uh, they're all naive in a sense, and many of them are tricked in, uh, in doing what they have been doing. Patricia Gerber heads an NGO called Locked Up in a Foreign Country that is lobbying for a PTA. The mules are, like I said, it's their job. They've been doing it for years. A decoy is the first time offender. In his letters, Gerard writes that he was introduced to a West African businessman by a South African friend in Gauteng to set up a business exporting apples. Between February and June 2013, he was flown to Cotinou, Benin, and to Manila, Philippines, ostensibly to meet his prospective business partners. Then he was sent to Vietnam via Bangkok. Along the way, he was wined and dined, and even presented with a new set of luggage as a gift. When he was eventually arrested in Bangkok, after a tip-off en route to Vietnam, he had probably done several drug runs without his knowledge, he insists. I think it's so easy to just assume somebody's guilty, but, but what, if, what if there's a 5% chance or a 1% chance that that person is telling the truth? The absolute desperation of that is something I can't even begin to imagine. Gary's letters paint a heartbreaking picture of isolation and despair. In Bangkwang, he attempted suicide by slitting his throat with a razor blade. He was still forced to stand trial, heavily sedated. The media were there, but no embassy staff. Barefoot, manacled and disorientated, he says he was forced to sign documents in Thai without a translator present. This is in contravention of international law. I was loaded in the back of a police van and taken to court. It was impossible to comprehend under medication. I could not even think straight, but I was in court with no lawyer or translator. I was told before the judge came that I had no choice but to plead guilty. Did he get adequate legal representation? Did he get the representation and the support from the South African Embassy that, as a South African citizen, he's entitled to? And that's what I care about. As a, a country, we have obligations in terms of international law to make sure that if we can prevent a human rights violation, we have to prevent it. I kind of wonder where my country sits, where my government sits, when, especially when we come from such a painful past in terms of human rights abuses. So is South Africa likely to change its stance on PTAs? DERCO has to do the negotiation of the treaty um, and really uh, uh, I think that if Durko started off with simply the SADC uh, nations, um, that would account for about 90% of the detainees in any event. But you will need to engage the Department of Justice uh, to deal with that question. Uh, but I don't think uh, um, you can say refuse. Uh, there are certainly uh, processes that are underway to discuss this matter because uh, it's a matter that you need to discuss comprehensively. The Departments of Justice and Correctional Services have now merged into the Justice Ministry. They confirm that PTA talks with SADC are now approaching cabinet level. Talks between Correctional Services and SADC have been in slow progress since 2004, but responsibility for a PTA also lies with the Department of International Relations. If we were to effect just a SADC treaty um, involving the repatriation of prisoners, we would save around about 26 million rands a year and that is money that could be better spent uh, um, on other purposes. Meanwhile, Thailand has signed PTAs with 24 countries in order to alleviate severe prison overcrowding. Conditions for the 11 South African inmates are deteriorating to such an extent that Henk van Staan has sent a desperate plea to our government to sign a PTA. I think that what, what the South African government as such should do is to, uh, to do what all other countries are doing, is a, is a prison transfer agreement um, to allow the prisoners to be close to their families. Because the, the family support is quite important and it is even more important here in the Thai prisons that the only thing you get for free in jail here is the air you breathe. Civil society has to get involved and uh, convince uh, the relevant government departments 
that uh, is extremely important that uh, South Africans who are imprisoned abroad are uh, transferred to serve their sentences in South Africa. The families need to form interest groups. They need to start petitioning government. I have with me scores of letters written by South Africans incarcerated abroad. In the letters, they take full responsibility for their crimes. They simply ask our government to forgive them, to give them a second chance and the right to return home to serve the remainder of their sentences close to their loved ones. Locked up in foreign lands, out of sight, they are determined to be heard.